Hey, this is Lee Balkum. Just got off the phone with Jan. Uh, Jan said I could tell this story and Jan called because she had just gotten the speech. It might be a speech that you've heard yourself. It's the, I love you, but I'm not in love with you speech. Now, part of what the question was for Jan was, what do I do from here? Because I don't even know what that means. And I certainly don't know how to respond to that. That's a big one, right? Even if you know that your marriage is in trouble, like Jan knew, even if you know that there are some problems that could eventually come together in, in a big crisis, like Jan did, that, that particular speech, it's hard. I mean, it's kind of like if you're in school and you know you're not doing well in a class, but then you open that report card and you see the grade. It's, it's there, black and white. It's, it's as clear as it can be. Or maybe it's kind of like, you know, when you know that your finances are a little out of control, but then you add it all up and you see the number. It's not that anything changed except for you actually, you see the result right there. And that's what happened with Jan. She saw the result right there, that speech, that talk. Her husband said he wasn't exactly sure what to do from there, but he didn't think that he could go on in the marriage and they had to figure out what they were going to do. Jan has been married for 20 some years, has three kids, two are teenagers. And so she's trying to figure out what to do in that situation. My guess is even if the little statistics here and there are different, the demographics are different for you, you might be feeling in that same place. You might be wondering, what do I do? What does it mean? And, and so I want to talk about three things not to do. But first, I want to talk about what that means, what it means when somebody says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And then I want to talk about what you do from there. Okay, so let's start with what does it mean? If you have watched my other videos, you know that what happens in a typical relationship, I mean, two great people, right? But in the relationship themselves, how did he get into trouble? They hit the pause button, right? The pause button marriage, as I've talked about over and over, is what eats away at the relationship because it's a disconnect right? You, you pull the plug on connection between you and connection is what you need. In fact, that feeling of in love comes from an overabundance of connection. So to break that little phrase down, I love you, but I'm not in love with you basically means that we've lost the connection. I know that I have this commitment to you. I know that, you know, we are in this relationship and, and I still have some feelings of warmth and feelings of, you know, of belonging in this, but I don't feel that connection. That's what it means. So part of the, the issue has been that the disconnection has led to a reduction. If you think about We've got some level of connection, right? And, and maybe when you got married, you know, the, the connection was off the, off the charts. And then as you return to normal life, it gets to here. And then you hit pause. And over time, it begins to dwindle. It's kind of like if you're driving in a car and you're not pulling over to get gas, it just keeps on dropping down the tank. And the tank of love gets lower and lower and lower until finally it crosses the point where you feel that in love, I'm, you know, we're, this is a, us, a couple, and I love you, right? And it could be, I love you because you're the parent of my child. I love you because uh, we have this life together. I love you because of the history we've invested. I love you because of the memories we have together. There are lots of ways that there's still, I love you there. But it's pointing to the fact that now somebody is reacting to the fact that the love that needed to be there isn't there. It's not carrying you forward anymore. And so in that moment, you've got to decide how you're going to react. I want to tell you about three ways that people react poorly so that you can avoid that or understand what you did and begin to work to reverse that damage. The first one that I see very frequently is people try to convince, cajole, beg, shame, uh, try to somehow get the person to change their mind. And so there may be lots of tears, lots of pointing to all these uh, facts. How could you do that? Let me shame you. Raising voices. So a lot of emotionality to it. And, and, and here's the problem with that approach. 
the person is saying, I don't feel close to you. And you're trying to pull them close to you. You're trying to force them close to you. And all that does is it creates a backward pedaling. And, and so we talked about those fears in uh, another video about the fear of intimacy and the fear of abandonment. And so in that moment, you may have your fear of abandonment triggered. And as you're doing that begging and pleading and conjoling and begging, you're creating a fear of intimacy from your spouse who's, who's suddenly going, I, I'm not, I don't feel it right now. I, I need some distance here. And they're trying to create some space some emotional space because they don't know what to do. And so part of what happens when people react, and, and it's a fairly typical reaction, is they immediately go into this, this begging and pleading and, and cajoling and shaming and, and trying to force the person to see things differently. So that's the, the, the first big mistake I see people make. The second one is somewhat related, but there's a different nuance to it because instead of all that emotionality, Maybe you walked away, maybe you took a walk or a drive or had some time to think about it, talk with your friends, whatever it was. And you've realized that there are some reasons that you have, some logic. Oh, so if the emotionality is not going to work, let's logically talk about that. That's what's going on in your mind. And so you have what I refer to as the talk, right? This is the talk. Now, this is, I've said before, don't have the talk, don't have the relationship talk. And I went the relationship talk. Some people took that to mean don't talk about your relationship at all. Not what I said. Don't have the relationship talk. So let's talk about what the talk is about. This is when you in your mind have gathered all of the reasons why that this can't happen, right? That the relationship has to get back on track where you, where you have to work towards resolution rather than towards divorce and disillusion. And so as you're thinking about that, you come up with this list in your head, this dialogue that runs through your head. And so you're creating this dialogue that you think if you just sit down and you have this heart to heart with your spouse, this mind to mind with your spouse, and you go through your reasons, your spouse is going to go, Oh, I see what you mean. Let's not, let's not go towards dissolution. Let's go towards resolution. And so in that moment, you think you have created this script in your head. There's only one problem. Your spouse has a script in their head too. And it's not the same as yours. So imagine for a moment that there are actors who have come together to make a movie and each of them have a different script that they have. And maybe there's even a similar plot line, but it's a different script. And so as they're reading their lines, the other person's going, that's not matching up with the lines I got in my head. Now we're off script. And that's what happens in those talks. They begin to be convoluted. There's another way that I talk about those talks. And that is having couples therapy without the therapist. Because what you end up doing is getting to this deep psychological, psychologizing conversations where maybe you talk about what's wrong with the other person psychologically, rarely what's wrong with ourselves, that we don't typically do that, but what's wrong with the other person, uh, what's wrong with the relationship, the theories behind that. And you, so you talk about the problems, but you're not solving them. Because again, there are two different scripts going on with two different opinions. Both people usually looking at the other going, it's your psychological problems that's gotten us into this problem. Instead of going, what is our base issue in our relationship? Connection is the answer. But you can't get to that point because that's already been lost in the process. And so part of what happens in the having the talk is two different scripts going sideways as you're talking at each other, not with each other. And they tend to go on to exhaustion. I've had people tell me that they've had these conversations for two, three, four, five hours straight. What is going to be solved in that length of time? Nothing other than moving you towards dissolution. It rarely moves people towards resolution. So don't get fall, fall into that trap. That's the trap that gets lots of other people. If they avoid the emotionality or after the emotionality, they come back with some logicality, right? They're going to go, okay, let's, let's have this talk and I've got it in my head. I know what will convince you, right? So we go from that begging to logical convincing doesn't work. Usually all you do is harden your positions. There's this idea that 
uh, when we are forced to defend our position, we will only reinforce our position. So that's one of the reasons I tell people don't spend a lot of time trying to get your spouse to tell you what are the chances because they're going to tell you what are the chances in their head at that moment and then they're going to begin to harden that position in. The more they have to explain themselves, the more they have to defend themselves, the more they harden their position until they're unwilling to budge going forward, creating more damage. Okay, So the first thing, no begging, no pleading, no cajoling, no shaming, none of that. Second thing, don't have the relationship talk. Third, don't take legal action. I don't know how many times I've had people call me and say, hey, we just got divorced. And I'll say, what happened? Well, I started it because I was trying to get their attention. Never use divorce proceedings to try to get your spouse's attention that you want to try to save the marriage. Because all you're doing is saying, I'm with you. I'm on board. And so many times I've watched people take quantum leaps in the crisis, huge leaps in the crisis. They go from this beginning process that I think probably could have been resolved all the way to divorce proceedings because they can't hit the pause button on that. They hit the pause button on their relationship, but then they accelerate the process of dissolution and they end up in a, a divorce that they might have even started themselves. And they'll say, I never wanted a divorce. And my question is, then why would you ever start any legal process? That's something that your spouse can do if your spouse is convinced of that and you don't have control over that. But don't start it yourself, not to get their attention, not to bring shock and all, not to prove them wrong, not to prove you're hurt. Don't use the process in that way. Those three pieces are going to help you bypass many of the problems that I see along the way. Now, many times people say, say to me, OK, I don't want that, but I don't want to be a statistic. I don't want to be a statistic. You're going to be a statistic. It's just which statistic you're going to be. Are you going to be the statistic of the relationships that ended in divorce or the other statistic of people who saved their relationship? You're going to be a statistic. At this point, you've got a marriage crisis. And so no matter what we do, we as humans are in some statistic. And so you knew you have this moment right now where you can decide which am I going towards? Am I just going to fall into the statistic of yet another relationship, another marriage that ended in divorce? Or am I going to work towards the statistic of we survived the crisis and we're doing great? Which one do you want? If you're choosing the statistic of I give up, I walk away, just turn this video off. Nothing else applies. But what if you want to be in that other camp? You want to be in the group that saves their relationship, saves their marriage. I want to give you some kind of starting point thoughts to get there. Do you remember back in school when maybe you were in journalism class or maybe just English class and they told you that every, uh, if you're going to cover a story as a journalist, every, every journalist has to answer five questions. Do you remember what they are? Who? What? When? where, how, and there's one more, why. Who, what, when, where, how, why. Who, what, when, where, how, and then there's the six, why. The why is the one that many times in journalism they go, you can't answer that. We have to answer it with this one, okay? Who, what, when, where, how, good story base. Why, sometimes we feel like we can't get to that these days, but those six questions matter here. The five journalist questions that they have to be careful about that six because of the subjectivity piece, we answer it here, okay? So let's talk about the who, what, when, where, how, and why of this. First of all, who? At this point, if your spouse is saying, I don't know what to do here, the who is you. You're the one who has to decide, I'm going to work on this. There's a myth that you can't save your marriage unless both people are working on it myth or lie, whichever word you like. It's not true. I see it every single day. Now, eventually, does a spouse have to join you in the process? Yes. Does a ha spouse have to start with you in the process? No. So who? You. If you want to get to that camp where you save your marriage, you. Who is you? Simple way to get there. What? 
This one is, what do you need to do? I'm going to bounce that to the end of this because we're going to come back to the, the what. Who, what, when. This is a big one. Now. Now. I know you're hurting. I know it's painful to hear that. Now is when you get started. Let me tell you why. The longer any crisis goes on, the more entrenched it becomes, the more damage is done, the, the lower the chances of resolving it well. It's just like if you have some illness, right? Sure, there are some illnesses that if you just leave them alone, they'll resolve themselves. Our body's defense systems will finally kick in. You catch a cold, your body will likely fight it off, not always. Catch the flu, your body will likely fight it off over time, not always. If you break a bone, you know, you need to give it some time to heal. But there are others. Say you have cancer or diabetes or uh, maybe a cardio uh, issue and you just let it go on. It's likely that it's just going to worsen until finally something breaks. And so that's a time thing. You know, the faster, the faster you get busy treating cancer, the more likely it is that you'll survive. The longer it goes on, the more the chance it has of spreading, the more the chance it has of dominating your system, the lower your chances. It's the same with this. There is a need for uh, expediency in a crisis. Now, that doesn't mean you rush the process. It means you get started now. You, remember the who? You get started when? Now, because we want to make sure that we start addressing these issues as soon as they are coming up. You can't wait until, well, we'll just see how this goes, right? Many people do that. And let me remind you that this is often the reason that the marriage is in trouble in the first place. We'll connect later. We'll get back to us. We'll deal with this another time. We'll talk through this another time. And connection keeps getting knocked down. And so part of this process is going, now is the time to begin moving towards resolution. Now is the time to begin working towards restoring this. Otherwise, we are beginning to detour towards dissolution. And we want to work towards the resolution part. Okay, so who? You. When? Now. Okay, who? What? We'll come back to. When? Where? Here. Wherever you are. Wherever you are is where you begin addressing this. Now, why do I have to put that in there? Because many times people um, try to do geographic cures. You know, they they go off on a long trip. They'll move. They'll do lots of other things. Geographic cures, if you'll talk to any therapist, usually don't help long term. They don't usually solve the problem long term. Can be fun, right? Go to a resort. Great fun. You still have to come back because the two of you are going there and the two of you are coming back. You still got to deal with that. Move to another place. Guess who's going to that other place if you're still going as a couple? You are. Both of you are. Right? And so part of the where is here. Here and now. Right? This place. Locate yourself in this this time, this place. There's another where. Do everything you can to not move towards separation, to physical separation. Everything you can. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but where working on a relationship is best done in the same household. You may have to do an in-house separation. That's much preferable to an out-of-house separation. But the where also is trying to keep both of you in a closer area so that you can work on restoring and healing that disconnection, right? So where, don't flee the scene don't flee the house. Many times I see that. People are like, you know, I decided since my spouse said I don't love you anymore, I moved out. Don't do that. My spouse is moving out. Find a way as best you can to stay in the same location so you can work on the connection. Do you have to work on figuring out how the space is used and how you don't crowd each other? Absolutely. You're going to have to find some space stuff. But the further you are apart, the more likely it is that you have a hard time getting back together. Many people go, oh, we're going to separate so we can work on things. Almost always, a separation is a dress rehearsal for divorce. What are you doing? You're creating separate households and you're going, oh, okay, well, this is manageable, right? Instead of saying, how can we address our issues? How can we move towards resolution where we are? So, where? Here and now. Now, the last 
two that we have hanging out are why, and that's important, and what. Why is a critical question in this. So one of the things I always start when I'm coaching with people is to say, okay, tell me why you're uh, wanting to save your marriage and don't just tell me, make a list. And so they'll sit down and I just say, just tell me every reason why you want to save your marriage and, and don't want it to end. What, what are they? And they start writing them down and, and we'll go back and look at the list. And there are some that are fear-based, like I don't want to have to date again, or I don't want to be on my own again, or I don't want to lose the house, or I don't want to lose half of my retirement. I don't want to lose time with the kids. I don't want to lose you know, friends. I don't want to lose all these things, right? I don't want to lose my, my place in life. Okay. All the ones that are I don'ts are almost always fear-based. That's fine, except for people tend to adjust to fear-based. They're not aspirational. Let me give you an example of aspirational. I want to show the kids what it means to work through difficult times. I want to break the multi-generational cycle of divorce in my family. I want to show how much I care and treasure this relationship. I want to prove that we can move forward together. I want to honor my commitment. I want to honor what I vow to do in the marriage, right? Those are aspirational, not fear-based. Fear-based will get you a little bit. You know, the doctor says, hey, you've got this, and if you don't change your lifestyle, so this is going to happen. And, and if you just stay with the fear base, like, oh my gosh, this could happen to me, you'll, you'll make a little progress. It'll last for a while, but the fears die down. We kind of get used to that, right? Fears kind of die down. And once they do, your motivation, your fear motivation begins to falter. But your why motivation, the aspirational motivation, those usually don't change. You can look at those and go, I still believe in commitment. I still believe in the vows. I still, I still want to move in that direction. So the first thing I have them do is list all the reasons why they want to save their relationship. Look through the ones where the, they're the, I don't ask the question. Is that fear based? If it is, you, it's not that it, it doesn't matter. It just, th those aren't the ones you're going to focus on. Focus on those aspirational reasons why you want to save your relationship. Hold those in front of you because that's why when things get tough, you're going to pull it out. I remember years ago when I was prepping uh, as a, a, in my job uh, as a therapist, one of my mentors said, make a list of every reason why you want to do this. Because after a hard session, after somebody's angry with you, after something happens, pull out that list and look at it and remind yourself of why you're doing that. I did the same thing when I got online because guess what? Not everybody online is very nice. And so I had to have that list so I could look at it and go, this is why I'm doing it because marriages matter. Because people who get married, they matter. What happens in our world, it matters. Families, they matter. Our kids matter. Our emotions matter. Connection matters. Vows matter. Commitment matters. That's what I put down so that I could remind myself in tough moments of why I keep doing things like this. Same for you. What are the reasons why you're doing this? What are the reasons that keep you motivated to keep working on restoring the, the connection, saving the marriage, and reconnecting with your spouse. Now, the what, as in what do you do? There's a lot that we might need to catch you up on. Many people don't understand what's really going on in the relationship or what they do about it. That's why I've created the programs I've created. If you don't have the what, please visit me at savethemarriage.com. That's save the marriage. Dot com. Let's get you started on knowing what to do. So we've talked about what not to do. We want to focus now on what to do. So you become a statistic towards saving your marriage so that you move towards resolution, not dissolution. I'm here with you. This is Lee Balkum wishing you the best as you work to save your marriage.